Hey, so a very warm welcome to Stations of the Cross, uh, which is a workshop exploring the way in which, for people of all faiths and none, the Stations of the Cross can speak into issues of injustice. Um, this session is part of Living God's Future Now, which is the online festival of theology, ideas and practice from Heart Edge. And Heart Edge, for anyone that's not aware, is an international and ecumenical movement for renewal within the broad church. We are a network of churches growing compassionate responses to needs, cultural and commercial activities and congregational life. So we'll be dropping information about Heart Edge into the chat, including links um, so that uh, you're able to join if you wish, um, and uh, especially information about other events that are coming up in our online program. Um, during April and May in particular, um, we've got a large number of events on the visual arts and uh, we will provide uh, more information about those um, towards the end of the session. Today we're looking at uh, a, a public art uh, initiative on the Stations of the Cross, um, which this year uh, has an online exhibition called Monuments to the Future. And uh, we'll be hearing more about uh, the exhibition and um, uh, the project uh, across its entire life um, from um, uh, Dr. Aaron Rosen and uh, Katrina Lang and uh, a number of guest artists that they will introduce in just a moment. Um, but um, uh, Katrina um, is a chaplain at uh, uh, St. Martha and St. Mary's Anglican Church in Leuven and Assistant Chaplain at Holy Trinity in Brussels and uh, Aaron Rosen is Professor of the Religion and Visual Culture uh, of Religion and Visual Culture and Director of the Henry Luce III Centre for the Arts and Religion at Wesley Theological Seminary. So. Um, we're very pleased to have them and uh, the artists that are joining them um, with us today. So I'm now going to hand over to them to take us through the rest of this session. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's very good to be with you. As um, Jonathan said, I'm an Anglican priest serving in Belgium at the moment um, and have been part of this project uh, for the last uh, five years five, six years with Aaron. Um, we're thrilled that we've been joined today by three of the artists for this year's exhibition. I'm just gonna ask them to give you a quick wave and then we'll introduce them properly later. But we have Dua Abbas and her partner, Johanna Zeb and Billy Mandel and Jared Thorne. So um, you're gonna hear lots more from them because they're the interesting ones who actually produce the art for these exhibitions. Um, but before I do hand over to them, Aaron and I are just gonna give you a bit of background about how this exhibition came about. Um, so as Jonathan said, the idea behind Stations of the Cross has always been that these, um, these 14 stations, these moments that we traditionally recall in, uh, in Holy Week, in the final hours of Jesus's life, evoke issues and emotions that speak right to all of us today and um, speak to people of all faiths and none. And the more we explored what, what is being um, prayed about and reflected on in the stations, Jesus was tortured, Jesus was unfairly condemned to death, Jesus was homeless, Jesus was stripped of all his garments, Jesus fell down again and again and again. Someone else stepped in to carry the cross for Jesus. These were all experiences that people can relate to today just as much as they could 2000 years ago and what we wanted to do was take this precious christian tradition and explore it through art and so what we ended up doing was choosing a city and then inviting artists local to that city and um, international to either produce a piece of art or choose a monument or a statue or a sculpture or a painting in their city that spoke to them about one of the stations. And so each artist had a station, Jesus is condemned, as I'll give you the example, um, 
we commissioned an artist in Washington DC for the year we were in Washington to produce um, art. He was an artist who himself had been on death row and come off and he spoke about his experiences and he had since coming out of prison discovered um, a whole well actually in prison discovered his artistic talent and then put it to amazing use after leaving prison. So the artists were invited to choose a station and reflect on that station through their art and then at the same time we put together a podcast inviting a theologian or a historian of art or somebody else to if you like make a further reflection take us even deeper into that station and when we did this in a physical city the visitor was then taken on a route around the city so following a map on their phone if any of you are familiar with Pokemon Go, it was a kind of Pokemon Go experience um, of Stations of the Cross. So you would be following your map and the little dot would stop outside the National Gallery of Art. And then you go in and find the painting that had been chosen for that station and press on the podcast <clears throat> and listen to a reflection. So that's how the exhibition has worked. And we've done it in several cities now in London, in Washington, DC, in Manhattan, in Amsterdam in Deventer in the Netherlands and uh, it'll be in Toronto next year but as uh, Jonathan said this year we decided to make a virtue of the fact that we couldn't be in one city physically going from station to station um, and go global so this year we invited artists from all over the world to offer a piece of art that spoke to their experiences of the last year and I'm going to let Aaron talk more about that but just before I do the other thing to say was that um, when, they, when they chose their art, it was a wonderful experience of reflecting with them, people of Christian faith, Muslim faith, and no faith about how this piece spoke to them about the Stations of the Cross. And as someone who has worked a lot in into faith work myself, I've always been um, humbled and, and really convinced that the power of interfaith dialogue is that it helps me go deeper into my own Christian faith, that by virtue of speaking to a Muslim and learning from a Muslim, I am encouraged to go back to my scriptures and go deeper into the Christian tradition. So my Muslim brother or sister helps me, if you like, be a better Christian or a more faithful Christian. And that has certainly been my experience with the Stations of the Cross, that inviting people who, for whom this is not their tradition uh, to come into it and explore it with me has made it all the richer an experience for me. Enough about me. I'm going to hand over to Aaron now, who's going to tell you a little bit about this year's exhibition before we bring the artists into the conversation. Great. Um, well, folks, it's nice to um, nice to see everyone. And uh, as Katrina said, uh, this year uh, posed some unique challenges, but it was it's been an interesting time to I think reflect on what the stations of the cross is cross project is uh, sort of five years in and where we want to go for the future. And um, and actually, in a, in a way, it was a chance to do something a little proleptic, to use a Christian term, but to kind of think about um, where we'll go um, next. And so this Global Stations was an opportunity to think about the kinds of artists that we want to draw into the project as we continue to um, evolve and grow, and also the kind of places that we um, that we want to reach as well. And so, um, so in a sense, it's kind of given a bit of a roadmap of where we might see ourselves heading, that, our, um, that one of our uh, stations is Detroit, um, city would become very interested in thinking about potentially in the future. And uh, uh, we have an artist participating with an image um, from Seoul, um, from the, uh, the Joseon dynasty and the persecution of uh, Catholics in the, in the early and mid uh, 19th century there. And a very interesting site. And so even just learning about some of the um, individual works for this station it sort of independently sort of generates other worlds and, and opportunities and ideas for thinking of other pilgrimage routes and, and sites to activate in, in different locations around the world. So uh, with Global Stations this year, uh, our theme was Monuments to the Future. And uh, we wanted to respond to a very <laughs> hard to summarize 2020, 2021, but we'll say complex uh, year um, and, and one filled with a lot of pain and a lot of different registers and ones that um, 
intersect in some ways that are very clear, um, especially when it comes to social inequities and some which are perhaps more subterranean, more subtle and how to, how to um, speak to these um, nuances and wrinkles. And so uh, one of the most uh, visible parts of this year was the, um, uh, the, either the reconfiguration, repainting or taking down of monuments which uh, have somehow managed to furtively or not so furtively survive far past um, times when they should have, which is uh, monuments to racists, um, uh, monuments indeed celebrating racism. And so the reclamation of those has been some of the most powerful um, and actually some of the most inspiring parts of, of such a challenging year was to see um, those legacies being severely questioned and uh, changed um, under pressure for social justice. And at the same time, um, we began to see small private memorials to those who passed away from COVID, but especially um, in the United States and in other places with um, uh, similar leanings from the at the national level, um, we saw a kind of aporia that there was no national discourse about mourning because we had um, for most of uh, 2020, for all of 2020, we had a president in the United States who did not want to acknowledge the um, the failings and the tragedies that were that were swirling around um, and brought right to the doorstep. <laughs> and in, in the case of White House, right inside many times. And so, um, so it really wasn't until this year that we began to see a widespread acknowledgement um, in the states, but again in countries like Brazil and elsewhere. Um, of, the, of this pain. And so we're just beginning to think, how do we memorialize what has happened to people and especially to communities that have been particularly savage because it's exacerbated um, inequities. So the theme of monuments and memorials really suggested itself to us as a way to bring together these two interrelated um, um, world historical <laughs> issues of, the, the, um, of systemic racism and uh, and a, what we hope will be a once in a lifetime uh, pandemic. So memorials being taken down and reconfigured and memorials yet to be put up, um, yet to be made. And so we wanted to ask artists to either take from their, um, their existing over things that they've done and find a way to bring that into the um, Stations of the Cross dialogue to say, you know, this work I've done actually resonates with this part of the passion in this particular way, or to create new works which um, which elicit those kind of um, comparisons in interesting ways. So that was the what we wanted to sort of ambitiously weld together in this exhibition was responses to the idea of memorialization. So I think I'm going to share my screen um, now uh, while um, I invite. Uh, and Billy and Jared to uh, talk about their work and maybe maybe we'll take it in order of where you appear on the on the station's path um, so I think that would mean that you go first Dua and I'm just going to bring it up now right, and and Dua and Johansson are participating as gold camera as a um, as a dyad here as a as an artistic <laughs> collective so it's rare you get an entire artistic collective on one screenshot <laughs> <laughs> so um, for those who haven't seen it, this is the website with um, previous year's exhibitions as well. You can see on the list here um, down the side will show you the art that was in previous years. Um, but I'm going to take you to Global 2021. Um, and um, I'm not going to play the podcast reflection. I'm just going to show you. So each station has the station and the work of art and the podcast and in this year's um, exhibition the the podcasts have been done by the artists um, so we wanted to hear from them about their choice of memorial so I'm just going to put that picture up um, and uh, hand over to you Dua and Johanna um, okay hi uh, thank you for having us it's I'm very excited to be part of this panel and um, um, it's it's actually more exciting to be on this panel as a duo. As a duo, yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, it, initially when we were approached for it, we weren't sure how we were going to uh, tackle it or uh, which stations would be more significant for us. Uh, but then we kind of pondered over it and what you see before you is um, called the Coast Minard. And it's it's a 16th to 18th century monument um, 
and well i think i think doa definitely um talks about it much more elo- eloquently than i ever will uh, so i will let her carry on about this and then i'll chime in again yeah. um okay so i had been carrying out some research on these uh, monuments already and then this opportunity came up which struck us as very interesting because uh, it basically entailed reactivating existing memorials and monuments and imbuing them with new meaning so um it 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 came uh, as a challenge but it also somewhat came naturally mm-hmm. to do so because monuments and memorials i mean after a certain time they take on an existence that is independent of their original purpose um and i actually read this uh, in a in an essay by james young i can share the link in the chat later on um where he talks about how once we uh erect a memorial or monument to a memory uh, we are basically also divesting ourselves of the responsibility to remember so uh, so the monument and memorial then kind of becomes self referential because it replaces that memory uh, with its own sort of material form so so you know then this 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 project came along and it was actually exciting to think of monuments in terms of these um, you know static almost forms that could be reactivated to give voice to a new concern and um because of the pandemic and uh, because of the uh, loneliness that a lot of people had been plunged into because of the pandemic we started thinking about um a catastrophic event from our region's history mm. which was the 1947 partition of india which saw uh, both our forebears both our ancestors uh, having to leave their homes in the middle of the night in india and mm. migrate to the newly created state of pakistan and um you know that got us thinking about the the loneliness of the refugee uh, we have alluded to that in the podcast as well and um then we thought of uh, these coast minars in connection to that loneliness because uh, the a coast minar was basically a milestone marker um there was a series of these that were erected along the grand trunk road in the subcontinent so the grand trunk road is this uh, iconic road that spans um afghanistan pakistan india, india yeah. uh and it's um it's historic it 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 was basically the site of a lot of uh, trade um stretching way back millennia back and uh, these coast minars over different centuries were erected by different rulers to mark uh, the distance of a coast and um a coast is is it it originates from the sanskrit word krosa which means uh which means etymologically it means to call mm-hmm. out or to shout to somebody um and it it signifies an earshot so i think for both of us it was mm. the poignancy of that that verbal connection and that uh, also symbolic uh, connection that uh, drew us to the coast minars as a potential site for our work for the stations and um i i uh, let jahan's they talk a little bit more about the image and the inclusion of this um shadow next to the coast minar well um obviously like do i was talking about the coast minar and its uh, significance to the call and we were obviously thinking about it in terms of the pandemic uh, but um, you know even after having taken these images and obviously we included one coast minar but they happened to be two in pakistan and we did go and uh, there are four oh sorry. okay yeah yeah okay i'm yeah, sorry yeah. i at well, yeah we visited two uh, we visited but two, yeah. uh, uh, but yes yeah, so and even looking at the image right now uh, the minar itself um, well since we're talking it about this in a christian context does uh, uh, make me f- feel it's more akin to a crucifix and mm-hmm. and within the context of the station it talks about the start of that pilgrimage mm-hmm. and again and even in reference to the shadow that we can see here uh, it's the reason we went we this is something we debated uh, whether to include the figure or not and the reason we didn't and went with a uh, shadow was for its universality and the significance of that actually bore out from islam itself and the fact that it's an an iconic um, religion uh, you know uh, there it had um, has it, become increasingly an iconic it has become increasingly an iconic it has a history of uh, of visuals uh, and, and of, of figurative visuals but exactly uh, with time more ornamental and and i and at least that's what we felt that the shadow in itself uh, signified became symbolic um, in that essence that 
it could be universally applied to everybody. It could be relatable for everybody. The act of pilgrimage, the connection uh, with something significant um, became, yeah, I, 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 again, I think we were trying to talk through symbols after a certain point as opposed to- uh, Recognizable or- distinct, Yeah, recognizable and, and to kind of widen the context of uh, mm -hmm. the monument that we were thinking of capturing. Thank you. Um, I'm going to stop you there and, and come back to you in a bit to ask a bit more about your about the perspective that you bring, bring to this Christian tradition. Um, but now I'm going to move on to Billy and her station. Um, sorry to whiz you through like this. Here we go. So Billy did station seven, Jesus falls for the second time. Um, thank you so much for, for having me, Erin and Katarina. It's wonderful to be here. Um, so let's see. Um, I had be, so much, much of my, my work as, as an artist sort of deals with, I think, of the, of the politics and the poetics of architecture and landscape. Um, I had been photographing um, this landscape before Erin um, contacted me. So 2000, some back up to 2000, 2020 was the most destructive wildfire season um, in California. I grew up in California. I'm living in Los Angeles right now. Um, and there was a gla the glass fire, the glass mountain fire happened in Napa County this past fall, 4%. Um, it was the largest um, wildfire um, this year in California. And it um, was very close to where I grew up. My aunt and uncle's home was sort of surrounded by this fire. And so I went back about a month after the fire happened and began to photograph um, the aftermath, the forest, of what was left of the forest. So I'd been making these images already when Aaron contacted me about participating in Stations of the Cross. And there was a way in which the, the sort of burnt destructive landscape felt like a, um, an appropriate anti-monument to the year, thinking about our climate crisis, thinking about the way um, white supremacy and capitalism has, is implicit um, in our climate crisis. And so I began to make um, these sort of very, I have been making these sort of dark photographs as a way of thinking about the darkness that um, we are all sort of trapped in <laughs> right now with these, um, with where we are, um, in terms of our climate, that there's really, we're sort of entangled in this destruction. There's no clear way out. Um, while I was in the forest making these pictures, I felt both complicit and I felt both helpless. Um, I knew I was complicit because so much of what I do as a person and, some, and having lived in this area for a while is bound up in why the fire was happening. I'd eaten in restaurants and shopped at stores that were part of the overdevelopment that had led to these, um, led to these fires, I consumed probably too much electricity. Um, and I also felt both helpless. I didn't know what I was going to do other than be making these photographs. Um, and I feel as very similarly in terms of the, um, my, my role in globally in terms of climate crisis, and I think many others do as well. Um, in terms of going back to the idea of monument for a second, the, um, the place where this fire was started was called Glass Mountain. And that's actually what I've been calling this sort of series of projects that I've been doing. Um, this is in Napa County in Northern California, and it's very close to Silicon Valley. Um, which I'm sure everyone knows about, right? All of the all the wealth, Facebook, Google, all of those executives go to Napa County like for their vacation. So this is sort of the um, the place where people go for the summer, or for the weekend, to have a nice time. And so there's a way in which all of the money and the wealth and the capital and power of Silicon Valley and all of all of what that stands for has sort of been the impetus or the underlying or the groundwork almost for these fires up in Napa. And I thought that the, that the idea of a glass mountain sort of captures um, both the frailty and the hubris of California right now. Mm -hmm. The idea of this um, space that was sort of built on this uh, monumentality of, um, of technology and power, but that was really very brittle and very frail and would um, sort of end up um, like this poor manzanita tree that you're um, looking at, which is not the kind of icon, not the kind of iconic fire destruction that one necessarily wants to see, the sort of, you know, huge grown trees, which sort of almost have a cathartic release, but sort of more of a kind of a pathetic in a, in a, in a poetic term, the, the, the idea of like this kind of pathetic entangled destruction that is mm. kind of harder to wrap your mind around. Mm. Um, I think maybe I'll leave it, I'll leave it at, Thank at, you, at Billy. that for now. Um, I hope that gets to it. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. And again, we'll definitely come back to you for some more. Um, Jared, I'm going to scroll us down to yours. 
um, which is crucifixion. Y yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, for this, uh, when Aaron and I talked, uh, the 13th station is very much about um, what happens to Jesus and like just the, the really like the visceral sense. And I thought about this project I started in I think 2017, where I started collecting autopsy uh, reports or medical examiner reports of uh, black men who have been black and brown men who have been killed by the police. Um, and it's interesting in 2020, I feel like there was this uh, racial awakening, but I think for many uh, people of color, this, this is, you know, unfortunately, uh, George Floyd's death wasn't, or murder wasn't anything new. And uh, I feel like these thoughts have been on my mind. Uh, yeah, and so as it relates to this work, um, I think what it does is I took these autopsy reports and I made uh, what are called photograms. And uh, it's a dark process um, and everything is, in terms of, it's like the opposite. So that the paper itself that I had was actually white. And then you have like this kind of generic body that's actually the kind of generic white body and that body turns black. And I was interested very much in the evidence and kind of like, what does it mean to be shot 16 times by the police? Um, and I think you start to get a sense when you see all these kind of exit wounds and entry wounds and GS, all these terminologies on the medical examiner's report. Um, and Cook County is the county that Chicago's in. So this took place in Chicago. Um, and I think there's something when you see that, and I think you think of how it relates to like the body of Christ, um, although different, um, you know, for a myriad of reasons, I, f I feel like there's something, like I said, just really visceral and brutal um, that's happening. And I felt like this, this work that I did uh, speaks to it. And unfortunately, you know, it wasn't, you know, in the series, I think there were about 10 of them. Um, so far, and, you know, I felt the Juan McDonald's uh, autopsy report, uh, I think kind of spoke the most to what I was thinking and envisioning as it relates to uh, the Stations of the Cross, the 13th Station. Um, yeah, I, I could say a lot more, but I, I don't, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll end it there. Thank you, Jared. Let's, well, let's, let's take a second to, to dwell on this image because I, I just, I'm so struck by the fact that we're having this um, uh, discussion now with um, the trial of Chauvin, the, uh, the ex-officer who murdered uh, George Floyd um, playing out on television. And, and what an eerie moment to have that during Holy Week and during a time when we think about um, uh, we think about trials, we think about uh, executions, all of these different things. And, and so it's just a really complex thing happening semiotically that people are, that, um, that we're, we're, we're doing this right now. Um, and I think the other thing is that, that one thing that's coming out so much in this trial, which is so directly related to these, these images that you've collected, these autopsy reports, is that there's um, we saw in the line of questioning the other day um, of witnesses and things, the, and I, I, an attempt to really take black witnesses and um, characterize them as sort of bodily and fomenting and angry in these kind of ways. So both black witnesses, but also black bodies being described in particular ways um, that this kind of sense that um, that something like that this extraordinary um, measures had to be taken by multiple people and these kind of punitive um, uh, punishing um, uh, chokeholds and these things had to be done because of the because of the type of person and so I wondered how how this is to, if, I know it's very personal and very challenging but if you could kind of talk a little bit about what it's like to have created this body of work but then see that kind of thing playing out on television and how it's making you think about um, images of bodies like this yeah, that's a, that's a heavy one. Yeah. Um, it's, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, no problem. Yeah. I, I think I, I go back to the idea for me that how this just isn't new. I, I remember. So maybe I think 
I mean, I think it's more fresh to certain people. Um, for I, I remember, you know, as uh, I'm fortunate to have uh, both my parents, and I remember my father and I having a very long discussion after Amadou Duallo was shot in New York and really trying to figure out like what that meant and why. And my dad's from the city, from, from New York City. And at the time we were living in Cincinnati where I went to high school. And, and I remember he was tr just trying to explain like what it meant to be like the, 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 yeah, what it meant to be like a black man in America and how like you're always a threat and like, what does one do? Um, what is one, how does one react to the police, even if one's not doing anything wrong? Um, yeah, I think in the trial, you see, you know, like the, the threat of the police, you know, like people witnessed this. This wasn't in a, you know, some dark alley somewhere and people saw this murder taking place, but they were in fear of intervening. Um, so can I just intervene, which, you know, just you saying that for the Christians on the call the day before Good Friday, I mean, it's just so resonant, you know, that's exactly what we will be sitting with tomorrow is that it was such a public trial and murder and nobody, you know, people just watched, even the closest friends didn't intervene, um, like whether they were able to or not. Sorry to cut you off, but it's just so absolutely relevant to this week. Y yeah, I, I agree. Uh, and then like, that's interesting with a lot of, um, so with Lokom McDonald's uh, like murder, it's one of those things that once again, it wasn't in a dark alley. Um, he was walking in the middle of the street and there were at, at least, strength because there is video footage of this, uh, at least six to eight other cops around. But one cop felt, you know, the, like the, the fact that he was walking away was a threat. And so it's like one of those things you start to like, what is, what do black bodies mean? Um, when, when I often, when I, when I show this work, um, I've sh showed it in a few different places. Uh, I show it alongside this uh, Claudia Rankine quote that I'll, I'm going to recite right now because it feels relevant. Um, and this is from uh, a New York Times. Uh, I think Claudia Rankine is a MacArthur Fellow poet. I think she won a Pulitzer for the book, uh, that short poem. I, I have it over there somewhere. Anyway, I'm going to read this. And it says, um, and this was after the... Charleston, South Carolina shooting. Um, and so it says, uh, there is really no mode of empathy that can replicate the daily strain of knowing that as a black person, you can be killed for simply being black. No hands in your pockets, no playing music, no sudden movements, no driving your car, no walking at night, no walking in the day, no turning onto, the, onto this street, no entering this building, no standing your ground, no standing here, no standing there. No talking back, no playing with toy guns, no living while black. And I, and I think about that and it always resonates with me about just, just yeah, the constant state. It, mm. It's, it's uh, sometimes it, it feels like it's great. Like I said, like these racial reckonings that are happening, but it's wild when it feels like this thing has been happening for like all my life. Mm. And so, and it's, but, but I'm glad that it, it, the conversation's happening and it's resonating with people. Mm -hmm. um, I always go to, as I mentioned my parents again, I never forget when my parents called me and they told me that like white people were marching and then my, my parents were just like, yeah, there were a few back in the day, but I mean, these are just white people out in the streets right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm always a little more cynical. And my dad's like, no, that's progress, Jared. This is, you know, things, things that like it's in the consciousness now. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I do think it seems that like me, hopefully people uh, think differently uh, now because these things are public and there are hopefully repercussions and there aren't these, you know, these modern day public lynchings. And so, yeah, I think there's, you mentioned the idea of the, pub, the, the public nature of this. And, and, I, and I think to me that that's, that's good that these things aren't under the rug and these aren't things that no one wants to talk about. I, I hopefully, yeah, I, I think more and more to this of this should be discussed. Uh, thank you so much, Jared. I think like, um, you know, one of the things that came through both in the words that you, um, you read and, and some of the reflections is the way um, just that bodies are signs. Um, and, um, and, and that comes through so powerfully in this work, 
that you did. And it also reminds me how in the end, the crucifixion, I mean, for all of the theological elements, the narrative elements, all the different things that we have as we discuss that kind of imagery, we forget that at the end of the day, it's a it's a body which is transformed into a sign. And it's one where, where the form of crucifixion was meant to turn it into a sign of degradation, but where that degradation um, was symbolically transformed again by Christian communities in the ensuing centuries um, to be one of a victory and so so there's a sense in in this image that you have that it's a, it's a it's a sign of um it's a sign of moral decay and prejudice and things perpetrated against a body but there's perhaps just as faint as hope that of these kind of reversals and um and, and a chance for something to um to to transmute um to become a sign of something different um, so thank you so much for sharing that. I think one of the things that's really interesting in the, the works that we, um, that we have from the, th um, the three pairings of artists groups, um, three, four bodies, three, three groups here, uh, is, to, um, is to think, where is the presence of the person? Where is the human in this? And, it, and it's so it's interesting that in Jared's piece, it's that the, um, that the reality of the person's life gets, um, gets truly flattened down into a diagram, into an image of the thing, of the afflictions that they suffered before they were killed. Um, when we turn our eye to Billy's work, we have this, this sign of human presence that uh, in a way of, uh, you know, as Billy said of, you know, this, these are places where people live and we are reflecting as we see um, these, uh, these charred limbs, I think it's very uh, helpful to use that, that word here, these charred limbs of the tree that we're thinking about um, what have humans done? Where do humans go um, from here? What is our sense of complicity? So there's a kind, so it invokes a sense of responsibility and presence. And then with um, Dua, Dua and Jahansev's work, there's a sense that the human presence there is a shadow that which I thought was so evocative um, how you how you guys spoke about that um, and and then a way the bot the the shadow being the you know being the opposite of the um, uh, uh, or or being um, in a binary with the with the monument itself and so it's interesting that in these three works it's they're all sort of revolving around the body but taking these kind of oblique or orthogonal ways of, of coming back to the body um, as, it, as an echo, a diagram um, in these kind of manners. So it's, um, so I think we, we got lucky in a sense that both, not only do you all you know, talk about really important things, but you also you know, ask us to talk about um, personal responsibility and, and personal histories in, in different ways. And I wondered um, if we might talk a little bit about something that um, Katrina flagged earlier, which in terms of um, people and, and responsibilities is what kind of, um, what does it mean? And maybe do and Johans, if you could start, you know, what does it mean to participate in this, in this kind of project knowing, um, cause I often ask this to Jewish artists being Jewish myself is that, you know, how do you, um, how do you engage with Christian material? Cause it's everywhere. Um, what does it mean for your kind of positioning to interact with, um, with this kind of uh, story, this kind of uh, material? And then we'll kind of get to other anxieties other folks might have about what does it mean to deal with religious iconography so directly? Um. I, I think I yeah. begin by uh, mentioning that I was I was brought up in a Shia household. So in, in Shia Islam, there is still a more lenient um, um, sort of approach towards figurative representation, figurative imagery, and in um, and in terms of visual culture also, uh, Shia Muslim households still have. Uh, their own sort of repository of uh, iconographies that are still as relevant today as they were, um, you know, decades or even centuries ago, when certain traditions started taking place. Um, basically, commem commemorative traditions uh, to do with uh, uh, Imam Hussein and the other Imams. So uh, for me, because I uh, participated in, in the Stations of the Cross 2018 um, as an independent, as an individual artist, then as well as now, it was the uh, basically the reconciliation of the spiritual with the embodied or the physical that that really spoke to me and uh, i think that brings with itself a kind of open-endedness that can be reinterpreted no matter what 
religious, uh, mm. uh, you know, in, inclinations you have, or even if you don't have any. And I think for me, it was, uh, I, I believe it was the open-endedness of the idea of a pilgrimage or of a certain kind of narrative arc combined with a pilgrimage, these different sort of milestones, these different stations. And um, I, I can actually see iterations of that in a lot of Shia Muslim traditions as well, particularly the ones to do with uh, Muharram, which is a month in which the events of Karbala are um, remembered. And there are processions that try to trace the journey of Imam Hussein from uh, encampment to his uh, the place where he was massacred. And uh, they kind of echo in, in certain ways the Stations of the Cross, you know, H him saying farewell to the females of his family, saying farewell to his uh, infant or, or taking his infant out uh, for martyrdom. And then, you know, sort of, so they kind of echo this, this idea of a journey from station to station. Um, well, yeah, I, unlike Doha, wasn't born in a Shia household. And, um, but yeah, my religion, religious uh, input when it comes to visual culture has been next to nothing. Um, and uh, I, I'm a Sunni and um, we tend to be less flexible and, uh, uh, and a bit, um, well, thankfully, my household wasn't, but more fanatic than the Shias. Uh, uh, however, so, you know, when it came to this project, uh, for me, for me, it was truly spiritual. I, I couldn't connect to it on a religious point of view. Uh, I myself, religiously, I'm pretty aloof. Uh, but uh, so I usually refer to Dua for um, any input when it comes to that. Um, however, I, I was even talking to Dua about it yesterday. I, so I could connect to it more on just the act of pilgrimage and, and the fact that uh, and in fact, Doha brought this up yesterday. It's it's an act that dates predates um, yeah predates religion per se. You know, it's it's something that uh, that's it's a drive within almost, for you to explore, for you to expand. yeah, atomistic almost. You know? Exactly, exactly, and and to seek something. Seek something, and I was I was telling Doha that uh, I can I and I don't mean to. Uh, remove the significance again away from um, um, more serious pilgrimages but at the same time I, I was drawing connections between uh, people going for burning man and uh, and and the fact that uh, for a lot of people it's party but uh, for a lot of them it it is something they work towards throughout the whole year and in the same way uh, in Pakistan we have the Sufi trail and uh, people just do uh, love the music there and do tons of drugs but uh, for a lot of them it's uh, it, it is something they prepare for it is it is walking in the footsteps of those saints and uh, but but yeah so I, I'm, I'm actually going to jump in now I'm really sure. sorry but I'm very conscious of time and we do want to um, bring the yes, other people absolutely. on the call into the conversation now um, so hopefully people's questions and comments will continue um, to pick up what, what you're talking about. Um, but yeah, what we were interested in exploring with you as, um, as people who've been putting this project together is um, your experiences of using art in worship and prayer and how you, um, how you see that working well and um, whether in your own communities that's something that you feel happens a lot or not enough. Clearly, um, Heart Edge and St Martin in the Fields um, are a really good example of where art is used. Um, but we were interested in hearing from other people in this um, workshop. Uh, and related to that, um, your experience of some of what these artists are doing is bridging the gap between sacred and secular, between church and civic community. And again, your um, your reflections on how art can be a medium for doing that. Um, so just wanted to throw those open as some ideas um, in case anyone has something to contribute or to put in the chat. <laughs> 